Welcome to the Organic Chemistry Podcast, Dr. Brian Lloyd's Scribblecast of Organic Chemistry Lectures and Solutions to Homework Problems. In our last lecture, we looked at how enantiomers can actually differ from one another. If you remember, enantiomers are stereoisomers that are non-superimposable mirror images. They are chiral, and they are identical in every way, except how they interact with other chiral molecules and how they interact with plain polarized light. In our previous lecture, we examined how this optical rotation of light can be examined using a device called a polar polarimeter. Now, in terms of optical rotation, there's some terminology we should become comfortable with. The first term we need to look at is the term dextro 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 rotatory rotatory dextro rotatory Dextro rotatory is a term used to describe the enantiomer of a pair that rotates plane polarized light to the right. So the enantiomer the enantiomer of the pair. that rotates plane polarized Plane polarized light to the right. All right. It is indicated by a plus sign in brackets in front of the name. So if you saw plus bracket to butanol. This would mean that this is the enantiomer of two butanol that would rotate plane polarized light to the right and it would be called dextrorotatory. The term levorotatory is the exact opposite definition. It is the enantiomer of the pair that rotates plane polarized light to the left. So the exact same definition, except it rotates the light to the left. It is designated by a minus sign in brackets. So if something's levorotatory, it would have a minus to butanol, for example. So if you see a plus to butanol and a minus to butanol, and these are molecules that have only one chiral center. If you took the time to draw them out and examine them, and I would encourage you to do that, draw the structure of 2-butanol and see if there's a chiral center in the molecule. You indeed find one chiral center. If there's only one chiral center, then there only can be a pair of enantiomers. And remember, enantiomers rotate light the same amount, but in opposite directions. So they are exact opposites of each other. And minus 2 butanol rotates light to the left. The exact same distance, but in the opposite direction. Now, an example of this type of nomenclature is for this molecule. 
Memodrot's Fischer projection. It has an aldehyde, and I'm going to give you both its common name and IUPAC name. Let's draw its mirror image. So I'm going to put a mirror here. So what you see here are two molecules. The common name for this molecule is glyceraldehyde. So both molecules are glyceraldehyde. I'll write it again for the molecule on the left or the right. Now the molecule on the left has a specific rotation, and I'll give it to you. At 20 degrees Celsius, the sodium D line equal to plus 8.7 degrees. So what is the specific rotation of the molecule on the right? Specific rotation for the molecule on the right must be equal and same magnitude because they're enantiomers. Right. The one on the left rotates to right, so it's dextro rotatory. It's symbolized by a plus in brackets. The plus in brackets designates how the light is rotated. Looking at the structures, however, it doesn't tell us how to draw the structure. The same with the glyceraldehyde on the right structure. It's a minus in brackets because it rotates right to the left. It's lever rotary. So the minus in bracket designates how that molecule rotates light. But it tells us nothing about the structure. In the Fischer projection with the longest carbon chain vertical, plus or minus, if you don't know the structure that rotates light to the right, the plus doesn't tell you where to put the OH. There is a common designation that's used in biochemistry, and that is D for this guy and L for this guy. Now the D originally came from dextrorotary. Let's give you a little history lesson. Originally the D and the plus were amalgamated into a small d. What they originally discovered was that when the OH was on the right in the fissure, that you had the carbon chain, longest carbon chain vertical, it rotated light to the right, they gave it a little d for dextrorotary. And that held true for a lot of compounds. A lot of compounds that had the OH on the right rotated light to the right. And so for the levo rotary, they look, gave it an L, a small L. Now, what quickly happened was they started finding molecules like this that had the OH on the right, but rotated the light to the left. You actually had a D with a minus. And so the small d was abandoned, and the small l. And they split off the structural dl from the way lights rotated. And the plus in brackets became how the light is rotated. The d referred to where the OH is. The l referred to the OH. So when you take a molecule like glyceraldehyde, 
and you draw the longest carbon chain vertical, so the C double bond OH and CH2OH are drawn straight up and down. When the OH that is furthest from the high priority group carbonyl, in this case it's just, there's only one. The OH that's furthest, if it's on the right, it's D. So this means the OH is on the right in the fissure. And that is for the fissure where the longest carbon chain is vertical, highest priority group is on at the top. The OH is on the right. This D has nothing to do with dextrorotary. The plus has to do with dextrorotary. And I'll just write dextro. So the plus tells you dextrorotary. The D just means OH is on the right. You can have D molecules that have a minus here. D molecules that are levorotary just happens in glyceraldehyde's case, it's dextrorotary. The L, likewise, means the OH is on the left. Okay. What does the minus mean? The minus means levorotary. Levorotatory. So we've got dextrorotatory, levorotatory. Talking about how lights rotated. Structure is defined by the terminology D and L. Well, if you look at the IUPAC name for both of these, we will find the longest carbon chain. This is one, two, three, a propane, aldehyde size priority. We've got a propanal. We could say propan one al, but it's not necessary. And then we have two hydroxies of two, three. So this is a two, three dihydroxy. Propanal. All one word. So there's no space between hydroxy and propanal. Now they're both this name, and you can see that IUPAC needs some kind of designation here to distinguish between the enantiomers. And we're quickly going to come and look at that designation. So we'll come back to this molecule and look at its name again. So this is all I'm going to say about this nomenclature. The D nomenclature of D-glyceraldehyde using common names typically used in biochemistry and L-glyceraldehyde type names. Now the minus and plus are only put in if you know the optical rotations. If you didn't know the optical rotations, you would simply write D-glyceraldehyde. Okay, so if you didn't know that how the light is rotated, you'd write L-glyceraldehyde and D-glyceraldehyde if you did, had no idea whether it was levorotatory or dextrorotatory. So the terms dextrorotatory and levorotatory only apply when you know the rotations. If you don't know the rotations, there is a nomenclature that allows you to distinguish between an antimer. It's called DNL nomenclature. Now we're going to look at this nomenclature again when in January when we get into biochemistry but for right now all you need to memorize are the common names D-glyceraldehyde and L-glyceraldehyde. We're going to look at the IUPAC methodology shortly on how to name these two molecules. Now there is one other example we're going to look at for D and L nomenclature and that's a very common carbohydrate molecule which is a very large sugar molecule that has a lot of chirocarbons in it. So I'm going to draw it now in a Fisher projection. And what we've got here, one, each vertex, remember, is a chiral center. Two, three, four chiral centers. And here we go. We have an H here, an 
OH, OH, H, H, OH, H, OH. Now draw its mirror image. So if I were to draw the reflection, So there's an OH here, H, H, OH, H, H, OH, OH. These two molecules are mirror images of each other, and because they're non-superimposable mirror images, they're stereoisomers, then they are enantiomers. And the name of these two molecules are the molecule glucose. They are both glucose. Of course, this is a common name used in biochemistry. Now, to distinguish between them, we use DNL. And as I stated, when the longest carbon chain is drawn vertical, you take the OH on the right, it's D, OH on the left, it's L. But look at all the OHs. Which OH do you use to name DNL? Well, you take the OH furthest from the high priority carbonyl. When you draw the longest carbon chain vertical, put the highest priority carbonyl group at the top, you take the OH furthest from that carbonyl. If the OH furthest is on the right, it's a D. So this would be D glucose. If the OH furthest from the carbonyl is on the left, it's L glucose. Okay. So I expect you to be able to name D-glucose and L-glucose through their common nomenclature, expressing the, um, the stereochemistry in terms of DL, along with D and L-glyceraldehyde. Now, other terminology that's very important in optical rotation is the expression racemate. or sometimes called racemic mixture. A racemate or racemic mixture is the expression used to describe a 50% 50% or 50-50 mixture of two enantiomers. Now we've already talked about the consequences of this with regards to optical rotation. In terms of optical rotation, two enantiomers rotate the same amount, but in opposite directions. So if you have a 50-50 mixture of two enantiomers, then the solution is optically inactive because the rotations cancel. So it's said to be optically inactive. Now what's interesting is when you have a solution like that, how do you designate it if you're naming it in terms of the optical rotation paradigm of plus and minus in brackets? Well, usually what you do if you're dealing, for example, with glyceraldehyde, you would say plus minus in brackets, plus over minus, and you say glyceraldehyde. Now, in this case, you notice I don't say D and I don't say L because it's neither. It's a mixture of both. It's a mixture of D and L glyceraldehyde. When you put the plus minus in front of it, it just says this is some mixture of 
the D and L, it's a 50-50 mixture, it's a racemic mixture, and it's optically inactive. Okay. Well, let's get back to glyceraldehyde once again. Let's redraw glyceraldehydes, if we could. And I'm going to just draw the D. And the question becomes, so here's D glyceraldehyde. How do you designate... How do you designate this type of chirality in the IUPAC nomenclature? So if you recall, the IUPAC name was 2,3-dihydroxy. Two three dihydroxy propan now. Propan one L or just propan L is fine. Okay, how do you designate the stereochemistry here? Well, the absolute configuration, the stereochemistry, which is sometimes called absolute. So if you ask to give stereochemistry or give the absolute configuration, it's the same thing. You're being asked to designate whether it, what an enantiomer it is using proper nomenclature rules. How, you, how do you designate the absolute configuration, the actual order of arrangement of the four groups around the chiral carbon? Well, in IUPAC, they use the RS nomenclature system. The RS nomenclature system. R comes from the Latin rectus, which means right. And S comes from the Latin sinister. I believe it's sinister. which means left. I'm not a Latin scholar, so if this is an error, please don't hesitate to contact me. So, one enantiomer is going to be labeled R, and one's going to be labeled S. Does the RS here have to do with optical rotation? This is where it gets confusing. Previously, we were talking about how light rotates to the right or left. Well, in this case, the R and S has nothing to do with how light is rotated. But it has everything to do with our priority rules of how we assign priority around the four groups and whether that prioritization rotates to the right or rotates to the left. So we're going to come up with some prioritization and use R S to de designate the proper name for these groups. All right, so we're going to have to take a pause on adding a letter to this, but let me just indicate that sometimes if you had a racemic mixture of this guy, you would put um, either an R star or an S star, or you might have something like R S star. in front of the name, indicating you do not know the chirality. If, for example, you did not know whether you had D or L glyceraldehyde, you might use an asterisk to indicate that you have a racemate. So asterisks can be used for racemates in nomenclature. Now, how do we assign the RS nomenclature? Okay. 
Well, let's take this molecule and draw a 3D image of it. Okay, so we all remember if we convert our fissure to 3D, we have this orientation. So here's a 3D structure of our fissure projection. Right. Now given this type of 3D, how can we assign RS nomenclature to this molecule? So I'm going to erase the fissure now. And I'm going to just go and work with 3D for a moment. And then we'll come back to the fissure. Well, in order to assign RS, okay, so we're going to assign R nomenclature configuration we have to rank the four groups attached to the chiral carbon we must rank them for priority rank the four groups oh my not another prioritization system well in actual fact we're going to use the EZ method of ranking so all the rules you learn for prioritization of groups in EZ, we're going to apply to these four groups. Rank the four groups using our EZ method. So the EZ method. Well, do you remember the EZ method? For double bonds, we looked at the two groups off one side of the carbon of the double bond. Here we're going to prioritize all four groups. The first rule in EZ nomenclature prioritization is to find the group of highest atomic number. In this case, we're looking for the group of highest atomic number off the chiral carbon. So, here's the chiral carbon. Who's high atomic number? Oxygen, carbon, carbon, or hydrogen. It looks to me like the oxygen's highest priority, number one. Okay. The next group, carbon, is tied with carbon, so we proceed out the chain according to the third rule of EZ prioritization. You proceed out the chain to the first point of difference. This carbon has an oxygen off of him. This carbon has an oxygen, oxygen of the double bond. This carbon now has a hydrogen. We can go on double bonds out to the oxygen a second time. So this carbon has effectively another oxygen. Oxygen's high atomic number than hydrogen. That's the first point of difference, so he becomes two. Now, who's high atomic number, carbon or hydrogen? Well, carbon is high atomic number than hydrogen. That makes hydrogen number four. So now I've prioritized the four groups. Okay, now if I'm working and if you have a, a molecule that is a colored methane in front of you with a carbon, a molecular model that's a carbon with four colored sticks, you can assign different colors to one, two, three, four. Rule two, rule two says, look at the molecule so you're projecting the group of lowest priority to the rear. That is, take group 4, grab hold of it, and turn it so group 4 is away from your eye, and you're looking down the molecule. Effectively, let's write this down. So we're going to project the molecule. Project the molecule so the group of lowest priority
group of lowest priority is orientated or moved to the rear. Okay, so we move the group of lowest priority to the rear. If we do this, effectively what I'm going to do is take this molecule and rotate it that way. I'm going to swing this OH round. In fact, if I do that, and I've got the H moved to the rear, so it's behind this carbon. I can't see the H. The OH is going to end up coming out over here. The C double bond O is going to end up over here. And the CH2OH is going to end up being here. All three coming towards me. Now this orientation is not the orientation of a fissure, but it is the orientation that you get for this molecule if you project the H to the rear. And remember the prioritizations now were one, two, and three. So basically I've moved the H in behind the carbon so I can't see it, and I'm looking right down. Now once you've done this, you select the highest priority group. The highest priority group. And you draw a curved arrow and draw a curved arrow towards towards the next highest priority group. Okay, so that means draw an arc from 1 to 2 to 3, that way. And then it's really easy. R, that arc is to the right or clockwise. S is to the left, or what you may call counterclockwise. Okay. So what we can do to assign R and S is we can actually use a methane model, assign colors to these groups, remember the prioritization of the colors, point the lowest priority group away from your eye, look at the other three, and if the prioritization goes to the right or clockwise, it's R. If it goes to the left, it's S.
Now what you see here is I've actually drawn R, which means I can go back to my fissure now, okay? And if I do that, I go back to my fissure, which started that, and do the IUPAC name, the common name, remember, was D-glyceraldehyde. The D meaning the OH was on the right. Well, this molecule is R23-dihydroxy. R23-dihydroxypropanal. What does R mean? R means the prioritization of the four groups around the chiral center is such that if you project the lowest priority group to the rear, then you get an arc in prioritization to the right. Now that seems to be quite a bit to take in. Also, you have to have a molecular model to figure this out. You could use the three fingers of your hand to do the same thing, and use your wrist as a low priority group and prioritize your thumb, index finger, and, and middle finger. So essentially using your hand like a model. But that really is difficult to put down on paper. I mean, if you're asked to show your work, how on earth do you do it? Well, you can actually show this same effect using fissures. You only have to make one small modification to the rules, the four rules that you were given previously. Again, in order to show whether the top molecules are S, the first thing you must do, always, is prioritize the four groups. Okay, so that's easy. So I'm going to draw the same fissure over here again. And I'm going to prioritize, and I'm going to just write CHO. I know that CHO is an aldehyde because carbon must have four groups bound to it. If it has one carbon, an H, then there must be a double bond to O. So, CHO is a shorthand for an aldehyde. So again, if we prioritize, we go through the whole process. Oxygen's higher priority than carbon because it's high atomic number, so there's one. Then we've got carbon, carbon with tide, carbon oxygen, carbon oxygen. This is the oxygen double bond, so carbon to the second oxygen, carbon to hydrogen, he becomes two. This carbon, therefore, is three, and the hydrogen's four. Okay, so I draw this in my question. I'm trying to show what this molecule is. I prioritize. Once I've prioritized, it said project the lowest priority group to the rear. In a fissure, put the lowest priority group to the bottom. So I'm going to do one interchange. Okay, so I'm going to do one interchange. And I'm going to put the lowest priority group to the bottom. If I do that, I've got to switch what two groups. So I'm going to interchange. The H and the CH2OH. So what does that do? That puts group four here. Group one, two, and three. Now, I draw an arc from one to two to three. And I ignore group four. If I have to go through group four, I do that. If I had to go the other way, I would. I ignore group four when I threw this. So it's sort of like I put group four in a box and I... I just temporarily ignore it. 
So when drawing my arc with group four at the bottom, I ignore group four and I draw my arc from one to two to three. Is this arc to the left or to the right? Is it clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, this arc is to the left, counterclockwise, and we learned that counterclockwise was S. So what was this guy? Well, we did one interchange. Do you remember what switching one group does? One is an odd number. What do you get if you did an odd number of interchanges? You've made the enantiomer. You made the enantiomer when you did that switch. So when you solve the chirality and got S, if this guy's the enantiomer, what is the enantiomer of S? It must mean the original was R. So using fissures, and by putting the group to the bottom, you can actually determine the chirality terminology and show your work on a test. Well, that's quite excellent. So if I give you a structure, uh, a simple 3D structure, for example, you can convert it to a fissure, and then you can generate, use that fissure, and generate a structure where the lowest priority group's at the bottom, figure out whether it's R or S, go back and you can give me the name. So if I had said name this molecule, and I had said give me the full IUPAC name showing absolute configuration, you would just give the IUPAC name first, 2,3-dihydroxypropanal. And then you'd go through, draw the fissure as we did over here, do the one sh interchange to get number four to the bottom, and you interchange it from any position. And then, once it's at the bottom, you figure out what its chirality is. And because you did one interchange, which is an odd number, the one you started from must be the enantiomer. In this case, the S is R. And so then I could add the R in front of the name, and I've named my molecule. Well, excellent. What if you're asked, however, to draw a 3D model of R2-hydroxy? Oh my, 2-hydroxy propanoic acid. That is, you don't give the name. The question asks you to draw the structure. The first thing to do when confronted by a problem like this is to forget about the R. In the same way you forgot about the E or Z when you were asked to draw an EZ isomer. Simply draw 2-hydroxypropanoic acid. Well, propane is a three-carbon chain, so here's three carbons. And uh, oic acid means carboxylic acid, so I'm going to make a carboxylic acid group here. 2-hydroxy means there's an OH. And now I can put my hydrogens in. So there's a hydrogen there, a CH3 here, and there we go. Okay, so there's 2-hydroxy propanoic acid. Well now, in order to draw this molecule, uh, I just have to find the chiral carbon. Is the C double bond O chiral? No. You must have four groups around a carbon to be chiral. This is about the CH3. Well, you've got to have four different groups. You got three hydrogens are the same. What about the central carbon? It has an H, a methyl, a hydroxy, and a carboxylic acid group. Four different groups. So this middle carbon is chiral. All right. Now, all we have to do is draw a fissure and use this fissure as our beginning position. All right. You can draw the fissure any way, any way at all. It's probably a good idea, if you know quickly, to put the lowest priority group at the bottom. 
to start with. Okay, I can do that. If I put the lowest priority group at the bottom, then I can immediately determine the um, prioritization. But let's say it's not easy to determine it, so I'm not going to do that in this case. Often, these types of questions will say, in your 3D structure, draw the longest carbon chain vertical. That would mean make the three carbon chains straight up and down. And put the highest priority group of the carbon chain at the top. And that's by regular nomenclature. So if I do that, the longest carbon chain, three carbons, is the carboxylic acid. So you have a CO2H. I'm going to put that at the top. And the CH3 at the bottom. Now, where do I put the H and OH? It doesn't matter. You can put it any way you want. Let's put the OH here and the H on the other side. Now, all you have to do is prioritize your groups. So you begin. Oxygen's high atomic number of the carbon. That's one. Then you've got a carbon and carbon. The carboxylic acid has oxygen, where this methyl has H's. So oxygen's high atomic number than H. So the carboxylic acid becomes two. And now we have the methyl. The methyl's three because it's high atomic number. Carbon's high atomic number than H. H is four. Now you remember for Fischer projections, before you can figure out what you've got, okay, what you've got, you've got to get the low priority group to the bottom. So I'm going to do one interchange. So one interchange, and this interchange is going to be used to get the H at the bottom. So I'm going to switch the H with just the CH3. Okay, there we go. And I've got the OH over here. So the H number four, so I've got one, two, three. You've got to remember to have number four at the bottom. You cannot draw your curve till number four is at the bottom. Then you can draw your curve, one, two, three. So what is this guy? This guy is R. But I did one interchange, right? I did one interchange. So what was the original? Because I did an odd number of interchange, that means this guy, therefore, was S. So this Fisher was S. Do we want S? No, we want R. How can I change S into R? And remember the question said, leave the carbon chain vertical, the highest priority group at the top. So I want to turn this S into R, and I want to do it without changing the CO2H or methyl. I want to keep them where they are. Well, one interchange will give you the opposite enantiomer, so I could switch the OH with the H. So I could do one interchange now. So the first interchange was just to figure out what I've got. This switch is to make the right enantiomer. If I switch it, here's the H and OH. I did one interchange. Okay, so I did one interchange. So if that was S, this guy's now R. So I have drawn a fissure of R2-hydroxypropanoic. Here it is. But we weren't asked. Read the question carefully. If it said draw a fissure, you're done. But if it said draw a three-dimensional structural model, a three-dimensional molecule, you've got one more step. That is to make the 3D. Okay? What would the 3D look like? Or well, the 3D will look like a carbon. What is a fissure? Those are going into the board. That's all the fissure is. Yes, but this is the three-dimensional drawing of a fissure. Ah, so if you're asked to draw a three-dimensional model, you've got to draw it this way. And so here is the 3D structure that's the 3D structure right here. 3D structure 
of R2-hydroxypropanoic acid, and you have shown all your work. You've clearly, clearly showed the prioritization. You clearly shifted it to the bottom, which allowed you to determine the, pri the actual stereochemistry, which was R, realizing that you did want to interchange, the original was S. Now, if the original was R, not S, you could have just drawn the 3D. But since it was the wrong orientation, I had to do an interchange to keep the longest carbon chain vertical. Well, we have to do that if the question says keep the longest carbon chain vertical. So, I've gotten my R, I've gotten the orientation of the fissure that I need, I now just convert the fissure into a 3D, and I've drawn. Well, there you have it. That's how you can determine the RS nomenclature for IUPAC naming. This RS nomenclature utilizes the easy prioritization methodology. You can figure it out using a model, or you can show your work with Fisher projections. Well, thank you for listening. My name's Dr. Brian Lloyd. This is my Scribblecast of Organic Chemistry Lectures.